I call President Larson to preside over the presentation and conferring of an honorary degree. I call Ms. Susan O'Connell, Bitley trustee and 1990 Bitley alumna to present Linda Zecker for conferral of an honorary degree. If you could both stand over here. Linda Zecker, versatile and visionary leader, exceptional mentor and role model, we are proud to confer upon you today the honorary degree Doctor of Commercial Science. Across industries and borders, you have cut a blazing path of achievement, re-engineering corporate culture, turning around troubled companies, helping them do well by the communities where they operate. Career stop number one was Texas Instruments. Armed with a degree in Earth Sciences Education, you took up duties as a geophysicist, usually the sole woman on a crew of scientists and drillers. Then as now, you've worn the pioneer mantle without letting it define you. The hallmarks of your leadership, candor, confidence, and very high standards are refreshingly gender neutral. You draw energy from challenge, leading 2,000 professionals in 100 countries for the $8 billion worldwide public sector business of Microsoft. Your growing revenue to, to seed, you then grew revenue to succeed a successful IPO at PeopleSoft, managing changes that led to acquisitions of software provider Evolve Corporation. In your hands, technology is never an end in itself. It's a bridge to something greater often education that transforms and empowers learners of every kind. The two blend perfectly at Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, which you joined three years ago as president, CEO, and director. Under your watch, the venerable publishing house that brought us Ralph Waldo Emerson and Virginia Woolf has found its footing in the digital world. HMH content enriches classrooms across the globe. You are similarly determined to raise the company's local profile, notably by supporting Boston area organizations that focus on education. It was Emerson who said, do not go where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. By doing that, you have our deepest respect and admiration. Thereby, by virtue of the authority vested by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and by the Bentley University Board of Trustees, we confer upon you, Linda Zecker, the degree Doctor of Commercial Science, Honoris Causa. We hold it a tremendous pleasure and a tremendous honor to do so. I now call Ms. Secker to deliver the commencement address. Well, thank you, President Larson, for the invitation and the very kind words. I appreciate it very much. I must say, I do have Nathaniel Hawthorne's desk in my office. The only problem with that is I am panicked. Anytime someone comes in the office, afraid they're going to touch it, put coffee on it, spill food, or something like that. I also want to have a very heartfelt congratulations for all of the graduates. You know, this, you're just starting off the beginning, the beginning of your future in business, and it's a very exciting time. So thank you and for the honor of being able to share that with you. You know, lots of people are going to tell you that they, they know what the future is, is going to bring or that they don't know what the future is going to bring. I think I have some ideas. I'm not sure that they're all going to be right, but I think I definitely have some ideas. Each of you probably has a vision for your career in life, what it's going to be, how you'll advance, where you'll live. Maybe it's specific with clear goals. Maybe it's not. Maybe you have milestones that are written down. Or maybe it's just a general map of where you want to go and what you want to do. Whatever your vision, there are two things I can tell you with absolute certainty. Number one, it's not going to happen. <laughs> and number two, what does unfold is going to be a lot messier, a lot weirder, more interesting, and far more rewarding than the vision that you have right now. Now, my crystal ball may be a little hazy on the specifics, but life will happen, and luck will happen, and it will take you in directions that you can never imagine. Maybe you'll end up sitting you know, next to a future business partner on an airplane, and the two of you will chart a course to save the world, or maybe just to make billions. More likely, it's the smaller things. 
It's random occurrences. It's new opportunities or new ideas that come to you when you least imagine. But I know it will be different than the picture you have right now. You know, it's the end of business school, so you're probably dreaming right now in spreadsheets and graphs. So when you think about your own graph of your own life, you can probably imagine that it's a trajectory trajectory from left to right, and you can probably see this straight line. What you probably don't have in your, in your plan are starts and stops. You probably don't have any U-turns, and I would almost guarantee you really don't have any failures mapped out. But I'm pretty certain that you're going to have big, fat failures along the way. And they'll happen, and the good news is that you need for them to happen, because if they're not happening, you're really not trying hard enough. And these will be setbacks, but they are the building blocks for successes to come. Presidents from Lincoln to Obama got creamed in their first election. Steve Jobs was forced out of Apple, and when he came back, the company was almost out of money. And Bill Belichick, we all know who Bill Belichick is, he got fired from his first coaching job with the Cleveland Browns. I mean, my goodness. So. <laughs> Safe to say, though, if you look at their careers, it all worked out for them. And it's all because of those failures that really allowed them to move forward and do such great things. So you'll get to the end point of your trajectory, and in, depending on where it is, you'll find new ones. And you're going to discover new things along the way, but it's definitely not going to be a linear path. And I probably know that most um, than, mo than most people simply because of my own career. I mean, there's definitely no straight line from geophysicist to leading a publishing company. In my case, actually, even becoming a geophysicist at all. I started out as a poli-sci major at Ohio State, one of the common choices for young women of my time. And earth science certainly wasn't something I'd thought about or even knew about, but I ended up getting into earth science the old-fashioned way. I had a boyfriend. So <laughs> that's what my boyfriend was studying. I quickly began to realize that you know, I was more interested in his classes than I was mine, so I joined the boys in earth science. I was actually the only female student at the time. You know, it, wasn't that, you know, it wasn't that I was trying to be a pioneer, I really wasn't. I just knew you know, what I wanted to do. It wasn't necessarily what I was supposed to do, but it was what I wanted to do. So after graduation, I again had the opportunity to join the boys as a geophysicist with Texas Instruments. In fact, I was literally the only woman in the office other than the administrative staff. So I was pretty steeled for the challenges that were ahead of me, and I wanted to make sure that all of my colleagues knew that I was a peer and why I was there. So it was my first day on the job, maybe 20 minutes into my office, and one of my colleagues walked in. And he looks at me, he said, hi, I'm you know, so-and-so, and I thought I'd give you a tour. Great. So he starts walking me around, and the first place we go is to the coffee room. He said, I'd like to show you the coffee pot and, and, you know, and how you can make coffee. And I looked at him, and I thought, okay, test number one, and I'm going to pass this test. And I kind of steeled myself up, and I said, you know, I am not here to make coffee. I am your peer, and I'm going to be treated like a peer, and I'm not going to make coffee. So he kind of looked at me, and he very sheepishly said, uh, okay, great, but we sort of take turns. I was just showing you where it was so you could take your turn. <laughs> like, oh, okay, got it. So I started making coffee, and in fact, I ended up making the coffee every day because, frankly, I made better coffee. This was you know, my claim to fame. So a few years later, I'm married to that boyfriend, and I'm still living in Texas, working for Texas Instruments, and I become pregnant. And you know, I, was on, I decided I was going to take maternity leave from Texas Instruments, but as you can imagine, the fact that they didn't have any professional women at the time, they didn't have a maternity leave policy. So I went in and told them that I was going to go on maternity leave and I was going to take four months and I would come back. You can imagine that they very quickly had a de facto maternity policy put in place. Short answer is, I took my four months, I came back, was on the job, and not long after I was in the office, I found out that they were planning on moving my group to the Dallas office and we were going to move. So once again, they did not consider the possibility that a new mother, um, a female in the household and not the male lead, would actually move for her job. So they simply never asked me if I wanted to go. So I very you know, quickly told them that you know, the rules were changing and that I would like to be considered and I would like to have the same opportunities as the men in the office and I wanted to go. So it turns out, and I said I would talk to my husband, we'd figure this out. 
As it turns out, he wasn't necessarily thrilled. I did make the move to Dallas, and I kind of gave up the husband, so what can I say? <laughs> Again, things are not always as planned, and sometimes they're a little messier. Fortunately, companies have mostly moved out of the dark ages when it comes to women in the workplace. But all of you, women and men, will find rules or the old ways of doing things, small or large, that get in the way of what you really want to do. So my per first piece of advice is break the rules. Change the way of doing things. But don't rebel just for rebellion's sake. Pick your spots based on what's important to you. But also take your turn making the coffee, because at the end of the day, that's really not the most important thing. So fast forward 10 years, I remarried more effectively this time, and we're moving to San Francisco. And my career had evolved quite a bit, and I was now running the payroll services for Bank of America. So my husband thought I was a little nuts when I came home one day, and I said that I was talking to a company called PeopleSoft. They had exactly eight employees, and I was thinking about joining them. Well, he had a lot of doubts about leaving the bank and joining PeopleSoft, and I was going to become, you know, employee number nine. But I got past his doubts, and I, you know, decided this is what I wanted to do, so I joined the company as, people number, as person number nine. So despite my enthusiasm, my husband continued to have doubts, but I kept telling him that we were going to go public, and we were going to do all these wonderful things, and we were going to grow the company. And today, you'd sit there and say, well, that's a no-brainer. That's what startups do. But then, that was just not a norm. The only companies that really went public were companies that had you know, a lot of earnings, and they'd been in business for a long time, and they had growth and profits. So it wasn't as normal of a thing as you'd think today. So when I kept talking about the pending IPO, he would very sweetly sort of give me that patronizing pat on the head and tell me, OK, I'm sure it'll work out for you. Don't worry. Well, it did. So the day that we actually had our IPO, I called him, and I said, we went public today, and blah, blah, blah. And of course, that was before CNBC, and that was before the internet. So he called up our broker, and our broker was like, oh my god, the stock's going off the chart. This is fantastic, blah, blah, blah. So my husband calls me at work and said, you know those shares? This is really exciting. I'm really excited about this. So it was just interesting how you know, everything changed around this launch of the IPO and, and what we were thinking. But, you know, I think that the time that I spent at PeopleSoft, those were probably three of the most rewarding years in my life. And part of that was because it was small, it was agile, we were pioneers, and we were creating a new digital industry. And it was hardly something that I could have imagined when I was leaving college, because no one had imagined it yet. It was new. And with the pace of change growing exponentially, your careers are going to be like that ten times. It's going to be an amazing opportunity for all of you. You'll have job titles with words in it that don't exist today. You'll start companies that can't be started right now because we don't have the, you know, we don't know how. We don't even know what we don't know about these new opportunities. But you'll invent the know-how, and that's going to be the exciting part. So advice number two is to leap at the opportunities of new in innovation, even those you don't know and can't even imagine at this point in time in your lives. And parents, friends, or even your spouses may really scoff at what you're going to do because it won't fit into the paradigm of existing career paths and established industries. But take the chances. You must take the chances. And maybe it won't work out, but maybe it will. And then 20 years later, you can look at your spouse and say, I told you so. So while innovation and new discoveries will be catalysts for your evolving career, so will the very big catalyst called life. While I was thrilled to prove my spouse wrong about PeopleSoft, I was also working and traveling constantly. And my son, frankly, needed a better school, and he needed a better mother. What finally tipped the balance for me was an innocent and mundane comment from my son telling me that I was doing the laundry wrong. And what he told me was, hey, Mom, we don't do the laundry this way at our house. So as you can imagine, I melted on the floor into a big bag of tears, and I was just, I was beside myself. And you know why that was the, you know, the final spark, I'll never know. But that night, I woke my husband up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and I told him that I needed to quit my job, and I needed to move. You know, I, I just, you know, I couldn't even imagine what this was going to be like and what, what 
I was going to be doing, you know, moving forward. This was just way too difficult for me to even imagine. So eyes half shut, uh, he got out of bed, he retrieved the atlas, and we sat on the side of the bed and we charted our next course. We somehow chose to move cross country to Charlottesville, Virginia, where I took a career break for a couple of years. I spent a lot of time with my son, probably more time than he wanted me to spend, but I volunteered and I gardened and I learned a lot of things, including how to do the laundry right. But it was a meaningful time for me, and it was a meaningful time for my family. So what tripped the, you know, the balance, or what was the tipping point that got me back into business? A board member of my son's school took me out to lunch one day and was getting ready to do a fundraiser, and he wanted to recruit me to lead the fundraiser. And his comment was that I would be perfect for the fundraiser because I was the perfect socialite. So the moment I heard the word socialite, I think I, I suppressed a primal scream. I politely told him no. Uh, I immediately ran back to the car. I called my husband, and then I started calling every recruiter I knew because I knew I had to go back to work. I, you know, I just couldn't possibly, you know, be the you know the perfect socialite. It was like an oh my god moment. So. I was fortunate to be able to take the time off. I was very fortunate, and not everyone has that, you know, that option. But either way, there will be times in your career that, you're really, that your job is your top priority. And there will be times in your career when your job is not your top priority. And in my case, I never would have gone on to do the things that I've done for the rest of my career or done them as well without the opportunity to recharge and regain my priorities. So lesson number three is understand your career is a marathon, it's not a sprint. Your career is an important part of your identity, but it's not the whole part. As President Larson said, continually examine and re-examine your priorities and find the right balance for different times in your life. A few months later, the recovering socialite was back at work, first at Oracle, then CEO of a small startup company, and then ultimately leading Microsoft's global sales and government education and health. None of these jobs were part of my plan. They were opportunities that came along, and I grabbed them. And I sort of figured that, you know, after leaving Microsoft, I would call it a day, and I was really ready to maybe take my career into that true um, retirement phase, again, not being a socialite. But then I was contacted by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Now, as President Larson said, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt's a 180-year company, but it was in steep financial problems, and it was a, a company that had a business model of selling dusty old uh, textbooks into a, a very quickly transforming digital age. So by this point, my husband knew I was a little bit of a nut, and so therefore couldn't pass up the challenge, and I couldn't. So in the past three years, we've worked through the financial challenges, and we held a successful IPO last fall. At least this time, he believed me that was going to happen. But what's been most exciting is the chance to reinvent a business, making an iconic company relevant to the many students and how they learn and school functions in the digital age. You know, I truly have never been more energized than I am right now. So I, I guess I would say advice piece number four, find something you can fix. You know, whether it's a project or a whole company, seek out a hard case that needs your skills and needs your experience. Failure will be an option, and that's exactly what makes it so exciting and so rewarding. At HMH, every day we are learning, adapting, and innovating, testing new ideas and business models for a fast-changing marketplace. Some of these will succeed, some of them will fail. But it demands continuous quick learning, building off of what works, and then moving forward. The biggest transformation, though, has not been the financial transformation. The biggest transformation has really been about culture. An important point is that you've got to be open to new ideas and different perspectives. As a leader, you need to actively draw those ideas out and create a culture that allows people to flourish. So search for the good ideas wherever they come from. And that's important to those who see the world the way, that's important with people that see the world the way we do, and it's even more important for those who don't. You'll have bosses who you think are not nearly as smart as you are, and guess what, they're not. You'll have colleagues whose world views run counter to pretty much everything you believe in, whether it's politics, religion, or sports teams. But amidst their many shortcomings, there may be nuggets of wisdom that you can gain or ways of seeing the world 
short-sighted though it might be, that generate ideas that you would never have had. So lesson number five is to listen for those nuggets. Be actively, purposely open to new ideas and people that have them. Particularly as you take on leadership roles, surround yourself with smart, creative people who think differently than you do, who argue with you, and make you think harder and better. Diversity truly is a business imperative, but not only diversity of race, ethnicity, and gender, but also of ideas. So seek and promote diversity in all of its forms, except maybe if you have a Yankees fan, you might not want to you know, support that. So, Openness to new ideas doesn't mean you're starting from scratch. It's about applying a fresh set of eyes, and it's about making sure that you pull out those ideas. Which leads me to my sixth and final point of advice. Ignore about half of what I've just told you. And the reason being is because that's about my life and my career, and yours will look a lot, def a lot different. Some of the lessons will apply, but some of the lessons won't. Now, which half or more, that's really up to you on what you want to ignore. But the training you received here at Bentley has you uniquely well prepared to figure that out. You came from a business program that's ahead of the curve in understanding that critical thinking skills are the most valuable asset that you can take into your ever-changing business world. They'll help you blend the best of the old and the new, decide which rules to break, which ones to keep, and determine which ideas to incorporate into your own mosaic and which ones to ignore. So let me close with one more story of adapting to life's curveballs. A few weeks ago, I was thinking about this speech and who could encapsulate the lessons I've taken in my own career. And again, while our company publishes Thoreau and Longfellow and Virginia Woolf and many others, I realized that probably the very best guidance was come, going to come from a more modern thinker, Curious George. So picking up on President Larson's theme, I'm not sure if Curious George had a career plan when he started out, but if he did, I'm guessing it didn't include traveling across oceans, getting jobs, getting fired, becoming a hero, going to jail, although briefly, and hundreds of other adventures. He probably couldn't imagine the diverse range of people he'd meet and help and infuriate and befriend for life. And I doubt he mapped out his frequent and spectacular failures or how they'd set the stage for even more, more successful uh, successes. It definitely had not been a linear path for our friend George. But he had skills and he had core values that were transferable and lasting. Most of all, he had insatiable curiosity about new opportunities, new innovations, and new people. And that's helped him become probably the most famous and beloved monkey in the world. So not so much of a bad life, he's had a pretty good life. So indeed, be curious. I can't tell you what that will lead to, but, and I'm sure it won't be planned, but whatever it is, I'm sure it'll be a heck of a lot better than what you're thinking right now. So thank you very much and congratulations.